everyone, this is the Kindergarten Rocks channel here. Um, uh, today we're gonna we're gonna read chapters eleven and twelve of Number the Stars. Show my camera up a little bit before we begin. Chapter eleven. Will we see you again soon, Peter? Emily blinked across the dark room. She saw Ellen, too, peering into the narrow wooden box in, the su in surprise. There was no one in the casket at all. Instead, it seemed to be stuffed with folded blankets and articles of clothing. Peter began to lift the things out and distribute them to the silent people in the room. He handed heavy, ca heavy coats in the, men's, in, the men, in the man and wife and another to the old man with the bread. I, was, I will be very cold, he murmured. Put them on. He found a thick sweater for Mrs. Rosen and a, wool and a woolen jacket for Ellen's father. After a moment of rumbling through the folded things, he found a similar winter jacket and handed it to, uh, and handed it to Ellen. Ever he watched as Ellen took the jacket in her arms and looked at it. It was patched and warm. It was, tr it was true that there had been a few new clothings for anyone during the recent years, but still, Ellen's mother had always managed to take to manage to make clothes for her daughter, of, of often using old things that she was able to take apart and refer and refashion in a way that made them seem brand new. Never had Ellen wore anything to jab shabby and old, but but she put it on, pulled it around in her butt in the button that mustached button. Peter Peter had had feet. Peter, his arms full of the uh, full of the old pieces of clothing, looked toward the silent couple with the infant. I'm sorry, he said to them. There is nothing for a baby. I'll find something, Mama said quickly. Then the ba the baby must be warm. She left the room and what and went back in a moment with Christy's thick, wet, red sweater. Here, she said softly to the mother. It will be much too big, but they will make it even warmer for him. The woman spoke for the first time. Her, she whispered, she's a girl. Her name is Rachel. Mama smiled and helped her direct the sleeping baby's arms into the sleeves of the sweater. Together, they buttoned the heart-shaped buttons. How Christy loved the sweater with its heart buttons until the tiny child was completely encased in the warm red... Ooh, excuse me. How Christy loved the sweater with its... Heart buttons until the child was completely encased in the warm wet wool. His eyelids fluttered, but she didn't wake. But she didn't wake. Peter reached into his pocket and took something out. He went. To, he wants. He went to the parents and le and leaned them towards the baby. He opened the lid of the small button in his hand. How much does she weigh? Peter asked. She weighed seven pounds when she was born. The young man, the young woman replied, "She gained a little, but not very much. Maybe she weighs eight pounds now. No more. A few drops will be enough. Then it has no taste. She won't even. She won't even notice." The mother tightened her arms around the baby and looked up at Peter, pleading, "Please, no," she said. "She always sleeps at night. Please, she doesn't need it. I promise. She won't cry." Peter's voice was firm. We can't take a chance, he said. He inserted the dropper of a bottle into the baby's tiny mouth and squeezed a few drops into the liquid onto her tongue. The baby yawned and swallowed. The, mom the mother closed his eyes. Her husband gripped her shoulders. Next, Peter removed the folded blankets from the coffin one by one and his hand and handed them around. Carry these with you, he said. You'll you will need these you'll need them later for warmth. Emma Marie's mother moved around the room and gave each person a small package of food. The cheese and bread and apples that Emma Marie had had helped her prepare in the kitchen hours before. Finally, Peter took a paper-wrapped packet from the inside of his own jacket. He looked around in the room as the assembled people, people now dressed in the in a bulky winter clothing, and then and then motioned to Mister Rosen, who followed them to the hall. Emery could overhear the conversation. Mister Rosen, Peter said, "I must get this to Enrique, but I might not see him. 
I am going to take the others the others only to the harbor and they will go to the boat alone. I want you to deliver this without fail. It is or your great impor- it is of your great importance. There was a moment of silence in the hall, and Amory knew that Peter must be given the package to Mr. Rosen. Amory could see it protruding from Mr. Rosen's pocket when she returned to the room and sat down again. She could see too she could see too that Mr. Rosen had a puzzled look. He didn't know what the packet what the packet contained. He hadn't asked. It was one more time Amory realized when they protected one another by not telling if Mr. Rosen knew he might be frightened. If Mr. Rosen knew he might be in danger. So he hadn't asked him. Peter hadn't explained. Now, Peter said, looking at his watch, I will lead the first group. You and you and you. He, he gushered to the old man and the young people with their baby. In, she said. Emery re- realized that it was the the first time that she had heard Peter Nelson call her mother by the first by her first name before. It had always been Mr. Johansson or uh, Mrs. Johansson, or in the old days during the m- merriment and excitement of his engagement to La- to Lee to Lee's, it had become. Okay, occasionally, Mama. Now it was Inge. It was it was as if he had moved beyond his own youth and had taken his place in the world of in the world of adults. His mother nodded and waited for his instructions. You wait twenty minutes and then bring the Rosens. Don't come sooner. We must be separated on the path so there is less chance of being seen. Mrs. Johansson nodded again. Come directly back to the house after you have seen the Rosen safety to Henrique. Stay in the and stay in the shadows and on the back path. You know that, of course. By the time you get the the Rosens to the boat, Peter went on. I will be gone. As soon as I deliver my group, I must move on. There is other work to be done tonight. He turned to Amory, so I will say goodbye to you now. Amory went on him and gave him a hug. But we will see you again soon, he asked. I hope so, Peter said. Very soon. Don't grow much more, or you will be taller than I am. Little longies. Long, little long legs. Amory smiled, but Peter's comments were no longer the, that light light and light and fun of the past it was only a brief grasp grasp at something that had done peter kissed mama wordlessly then then he wished the rosens good godspeed and then he led them others through the door mama emory and the rosens sat in silence there was a slight commotion outside the door, and Mama went quickly to look out. In a moment, she was back. It's all right, she said in response to look, to, to their look. The old man stumbled, but Peter helped him up. He didn't seem to be hurt. Maybe just his pride, she added, smiling a bit. It was an odd word, pride. Amory looked at the Rosen, sitting there, wearing the Miss Hapen, ill-fitting Miss Hapenil Hill, ill fit in clothing, holding ranks, ragged blankets folded in their arms, their faces drawn and tired. She remembered that earlier, happier times, Mrs. Rosen, her hair neatly combed and covered, lightning to stab it, to bath candles, saying that the eight chip prayer and Mr. Rosen sitting in the big chair in the living room, studying his thick old books correcting papers, adjusting his glasses, looking up and then to complain good naturally about the lack of the decent light. She remembered Ellen in the school play moving confidently across the stage. He gushers he gushers sure he gushers sure sure her her voice cleared. All of those things that source those source of pride the candlesticks, the books of daydreams of the theater had been left behind in Copenhagen. They had nothing with them now. There was only the clothing of unknown people for warmth, the food from Henrique's farm for survival, and the dark path ahead through the woods to freedom. 
Amory realized through she had not really been been told that Uncle Enrique was going to take them in a boat across the sea to Sweden. She knew how frightened Mrs. Rosen was of the sea. It's with it. Steph, it's cold. She knew how frightened Ellen was of the soldiers with their guns and boots who were certainly looking for them. Looking for them. And, sh and she knew how frightened they all must be of the future. But their, but their shoulders were as straight as they had been in the past in the classroom on the stage at the established table. So there were other sources, too, of pride. And they have not left everything behind. We'll be right back after this short little break. Chapter 12. Where was Mama? Mr. Rosen tipped on the loose step outside the kitchen door. His wife grasped his arm, and he resigned his balance. It's very dark, Mama whispered as they stood in the yard with their blankets and bundles for food gathered in their arms, and we can't use any kind of light. I'll go first. I know that I know the ver the way very well, and you follow me. Try not to stumble over the tree roots in the path. Fear kev feel carefully with your feet. The path is uneven, and be very very quiet. She added unnecessarily. The night was quiet too. A silent breeze moved in the top of the trees, and from across the meadow came the sound of the sea movements, which was a constant sound here and had always been. But no birds called or cried here now in the night. The cow slept silently in the barn, the kitten upstairs, in Christie's arms. There were stairs here and there, dotting, dotting the sky among the, among, among thin clouds. But no moon. Amory shivered, standing at the front of the steps. Come! Mama murmured, and she moved away from the house. One by one, the Rosens turned and hugged Amory silently. Ellie came to her last. The two girls held each other. I'll come back some day, Ellen whispered fier fiercely. I promise. I know you will, Amory whispered back, holding her friends tightly. Then... Then they were gone. Mama and the Rosens. And Mama and the Rosens. Emory was alone. She went into the house crying suddenly and closed the door against the night. The lid of the casket was closed again. Now the room was empty. There was no sign of people who had sat there for these hours. Emory wiped her eyes with the with the back of her hand. She opened the dark curtains in the window. She curled once more in the rocker, trying to relax. She traced their route their route in her mind. She knew that the old path too, not as well as her mother, who had followed it almost every day of her childhood with her dog scamp scampering behind. But Amory had often walked to town and back that way, and she remembered to turn the twisted trees who, gl who gnarred roots, pushed the earth now and then into not ch clumps. In the thick bushes that often frowned in early summer. She walked with them in her mind, feeling the way through the darkness. It would take them, she thought, half an hour to reach the place where Uncle Enrique was waiting with his boat. Mama would leave them there, pausing a minute, no more for a final hug, and then she would and then she would turn and come home. It would be faster for Mama alone with no need to wait as the Rosens, unfamiliar with the path, slowly felt their way along. Mama was her mama would hurry, sure sure footed now back to her children. The clock in the hall struck once. It was two uh, once. It was two thirty in the morning. Her mother would be home in an hour. Amory decided. She rocked gently back and forth in the old chair. Mama would be home by 3.30. She thought of Papa. Back in Copenhagen alone, he would be awake too. He would be wishing he could, he could have come, but knowing too that he must come and go as always. To the corner store for the newspaper, to his office when the morning came. Now he would be afraid for them and watching the clock waiting for the word that the Rosens were safe, that Mama and the girls were here at the farm. 
starting a new day with the sun shining through the kitchen window and cream on the oat on the oatmeal. It was harder for these ones who were waiting. Amory knew less danger, perhaps, but more fear. She yawned and her head nodded. She fell asleep, and it was asleep as thin as the night clouds dotted with dreams that came and went like the stars. Light woke her, but it was not really the morning. Not yet. It was only the first hint of a slightly lightened sky. A pale, grilly gleam at the edge of the meadow, a sign that far away somewhere to the east where Sweeten still slept, morning would be coming soon. Dawn would creep across the Swedish farmland and coast. There, th Then it would, it would wash little Denmark with light and move across the North Sea to the Norway. Emery blinked in confusion, sitting up, remembering after a moment when she was in, when she was in why. But it was not right. The pale light at the horizon. It should be dark still. It should be. It should. It should, it should still be night. She stood stiffly, screeching her legs, and went to the hall to look at the old clock. It was past four o'clock. Where was Mama? Perhaps she had come home, not wanting to wake Emery, and had gone to bed herself. Surely that was it. Mama must have been exhausted. She had been up all night. He had made the dangerous journey to the boat and returned th through the dark woods, waiting, wanting only to sleep. Quickly, Emery went up the narrow staircase, the door to the bedroom, where she had kept with Ellen, where she had slept when Ellen was open. The two small beds were neatly made, covered with the old quilts, and emptied be and empty beside it. Uncle Enrique's door was open, too, and his bed, too, was unused and empty, despite all, uh, despite her worry. Emery smiled slightly, slightly when she saw some of Enrique's clothes crump, crumpled, crumpled in a chair and a pale in a pair of shoes. Kate caked with the barnyard dirt laying on the on the floor. He needs a wife, she said to herself, imitating Mama. The door to the other bedroom, the the one Christy and Mama were sharing, was closed. Quick quietly, no n not wanting to wake them, Emery pushed it open. The kitten's ears moved, standing up straight, its its eyes opened wide and it raised its head and yawned. It's, it's pried itself out of Christie's arms, scratched, and then jumped lightly to the floor and came to Amory. It numbed, it numbed itself against her leg and purred. Christie sighed and turned to her, and turned in her sleep. One arm, free new of the kitten's warmth and comfort, flung itself across the pillow. There was no one else in the in the wide bed. Amory moved quickly to the window, which overlooked the cleaning that led the path's entrance. The light outside was still very dim, and she peered through the dis distance, trying to see, looking for the opening in the trees where the path began, looking for Mama hurrying home. After a second, she saw a shape there, something unfamiliar, something that had not been there the day before, a dark shape, no one than a blurred heap at the beginning of the path. Amory squint, squinted, forcing her eyes to understand, needing to understand, not wanting to understand. The shape moved, and she knew it was her mother laying on the earth. The end. Well, guys, I hope you enjoy enjoyed chapters 11 and 12 of Number of the Stars. Thank you for watching. Have a good day.